I know you took a trip recently to Israel. Um, tell me a little bit about that trip. Uh, it was like church camp. Uh, I grew up going to church camp on a bus that seemed to break down every other trip. And what I remember most about church camp is three and four hour stints in the Stuckies eating those pecan things and waiting for the bus to be towed and repaired and come back. So we went to Israel and we had a big bus with a bunch of uh, evangelical ministers, some Orthodox rabbis and just friends. We had about 50, 60 people on this bus and the rains came. And so we actually nicknamed our tour the flood tour. We thought we were in, or the plague tour. We thought one of the different, what was coming next, locusts, you know. So the, we were driving from Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee and the road was washed out, completely washed out. And so we had to turn around, go all the way back, all the way up through Tel Aviv. And then we came in and so we were all kind of punchy by the time we came in and we were driving into the Sea of Galilee, which is kind of going down into a valley. And I told him we need to put some good music on the radio. So we put Guns N' Roses knocking on heaven's door on, as we went into the Sea of Galilee. But it was amazing. With all that rain, it was just so green around there. And uh, one of the memories I have is we were on a boat, which sort of a replica. It's an old wooden boat going across the Sea of Galilee. And it looked like something that was from the time of Jesus. But, and I was kind of worried whether we were getting across because the winds were blowing. And you know how in the New Testament it talks about stores, storms popping up out of nowhere. It was literally that way. It was kind of rainy and misty. But then we had hail. And then we had wind. And our, our ship is tilted completely sideways. And then we get to the other side. And we can still see the hail coming down like halfway across the lake. And then we looked back and we saw two complete rainbows. And we got pictures of them back across the Sea of Galilee. But uh, it was an amazing trip. And, uh, you know, great memories from that. And what really made it special is we had people, not only pastors who gave sort of uh, little homilies or explanations of the different sites, we also had someone who would lead us in singing at the sites. And so one of my uh, best memories was at uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, singing How Great Thou Art in front of the Garden of Gethsemane. So. Were you able to meet with any um, ambassadors or policy folks while you were in Israel? I met with uh, the mayor of Jerusalem. I met with uh, the prime minister Netanyahu. Met with the president Perez. And then I went across the river and met with uh, King King Abdullah of Jordan. And then also met with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority leader. Uh, and just um, on that note, what are your feelings on the Israel-American relationship and how do we keep that? Well, I, I kind of laughingly said, you know, I went over there. I think I'm a smart guy. I figured I'd just figure out the solution and let them know what they needed to do. And I'm not sure I came home with a solution, but I did ask a lot of questions when I was there. And one of the questions I ask is interesting because it's very uh, appropriate or opportune now. I ask, I ask everybody. I ask Netanyahu. I ask King Abdullah. I ask Abbas. I said, can there be a separate peace? Can there be a peace with the Palestinian Authority and not with Hamas? Because they're, we're not, you know, nobody really seems to be wanting to negotiate with someone who's attacking Israel. And they said, oh no, it has to be one peace. And that's what everybody told me. And I said, well, how can there be a peace process then if it has to be one peace and nobody's going to negotiate with Hamas because of their behavior? Nobody had an explanation. And so in the last month, now we hear Hamas is joining the Palestinian Authority in a unity government. The interesting thing about this is that many of the news articles say that Hamas is joining because they're bankrupt and they're out of money. They want a bailout. Who do you think is going to be the bailout? The American sucker. The taxpayer is going to pay for this. And so I introduced something because it really upsets me to think that we're going to give American money to an organization that calls for the destruction of Israel. And so I said, no, I said we shouldn't give any. But it's caused some division up there. Some in the pro-American Israel relations have said, oh no, we have to give them. We just, you know, this is the opinion of a lot of people in Washington. You have to give foreign aid. You can never stop. And I said, well, if you're giving foreign aid to influence behavior, why wouldn't you attach conditions to it to say what, you know what, if Hamas wants to be part of unity government, they have to say they don't believe in the destruction of Israel. They're going to recognize Israel and they're going to have a peaceful coexistence. I think that's the beginning of negotiations. And everybody said, oh, well, they, the rules are such they won't get it. Turns out there's a presidential waiver in it. And this president is likely to use waivers. He used one recently to release those five Taliban prisoners simply by saying, oh, it's national security. The same waiver exists in giving money to the Palestinian Authority. They can have a waiver if Hamas is part of the government, but they think it's in our national security interest to keep giving them money. And unfortunately, that's the view in Washington is we always give money. The only thing consistent is we never want to let up on giving money. One, there's no money to give. It's borrowed. But two, I don't see giving money to people that are calling for the destruction of Israel. Thank you.